Welcome to Sync Up, a show about OneDrive. We are your hosts Ankita Kirti and Jason Moore. I am Ankita Kirti, product manager on the OneDrive team, and I'm Jason Moore, director of program management for OneDrive. This show will take you behind the scenes of OneDrive, shedding light on how OneDrive connects you to all of your files in Microsoft 365 so you can share and work together from anywhere while protecting your work from accidental loss and malicious attacks. Today we are excited to have on the show Joshua Badish. So don't go away. We've got another great show for you today. Today's episode is dedicated to all you admins who are evaluating or are about to kick off or are in the middle of migrating to Microsoft 365. There are several tools and methods that we offer. And today we are going to discuss about just that. We are going to talk about what are your options, what is best for you, what are the different factors and best practices that can help you plan and run a successful migration. With that, I'll pass it on to Jason to introduce our subject matter expert on all things migration. Our guest today is Joshua Badish. Joshua is a project manager within ODSP Customer Engineering Migration Team and is responsible for creating a bridge between the field, engineering, and migration tools and teams such as Mover, FastTrack, and the Microsoft Consulting Services at Microsoft. Welcome aboard, Joshua. We're really excited to have you here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So we'll kick off with the questions. Joshua, before we get into the weeds of migration and what you recommend and the best practices, I'll step back and ask a very naive question more probably. What do you say when a customer asks you, hold on, Joshua, why should I migrate to Microsoft 365? The bigger question, I think, is, you know, why are you choosing Microsoft 365? If I'm talking to a customer, they've already made the decision. Um, And and to me, that's an easy one. I've been working in the cloud storage space, oh, seven years now, um, and working with many different competitors to OneDrive. Uh, You know, I'm a little bit biased, but there's, there's, it's, it's hard to draw a comparison between M365 and the others in security and even cost. I mean, uh, the easy answer is the M365 suite that you're getting OneDrive with. So you're getting all the tools you need, uh, you're getting the security need, and then you're getting that storage with it. Um, you're getting Teams, uh, which is going to interact with all of these different softwares. You know, it gives you the whole package of everything you need. So no other cloud storage provider really provides anything close to this. And so that's just the easy answer <laughs> to me is, is you're getting the entire package with your cloud storage and, and uh, you're getting the security and you're getting the collaborative features uh, and you're getting those enterprise features that you need that some other cloud storage providers can offer, but they can't offer that whole package. And that's, yeah, like I said, just the easiest answer I can give value, I guess. Yeah. Well said. I love that answer, Joshua, because I think I think one of the things folks often forget when we're talking about all this technology and the different choices and components and pieces folks have out there, and there, there really are a lot, is that so much of what we really want to find is a solution. You know, we want to know something that's going to be thoughtful and help me get from from A all the way to Z in that conversation. And I think you kind of put a spotlight on how all those things come together. Yeah, and and absolutely. And when you're thinking about what your cloud storage space is going to be, you need to think about all those features and you need to think about what's the collaboration going to be like? Do I have to split my focus and my time between multiple different software pieces? Do I need to integrate the software I'm using with my cloud storage? When we're talking about M365, you know, Word is already in there. Um, Excel is already in there. PowerPoint, it's already all in there and it's all speaking to your OneDrive. So you don't have to think about that, right? It's already wrapped all, all wrapped up into it. So uh, it's an easy one. That helps a ton. And, you know, it's interesting because like, of course, different customers are going to come from different places. They're going to be at different states of their journey to the cloud uh, between different cloud services, et cetera. And so I thought it might be interesting to open up a little bit with talking about how we think about helping folks make great choices between those multiple migration options. How do we help kind of navigate the, those tools and those capabilities. And I thought maybe digging into maybe the top three as a way to kind of focus it would help us kind of frame some of the advantages and some of the scenarios people get after. You know, and off the top of my head, I'd probably talk about SharePoint, uh, the migration tool, uh, migration manager, mover technology. Uh, those are three kind of key pieces that are part of that. Can you talk a little bit about that and then maybe how, how fast track uh, connects into that and helps helps folks on that journey. So, which tool you're going to use? You know, these these are free tools that are offered. All three of the ones that you listed are, are uh, offered through M365 through the admin console at no additional cost. 
So really, which one you choose is going to be based on what, what you need to do. And how we point you to that is going to be based on what you need to do. So if we're talking about SPMT, simply put, this is for uh, on-premise migrations. So SharePoint on-premise migrations and upgrades. Uh, you need to upgrade to a new version of uh, SharePoint. That's going to do it for you. You need to get off an on-premise environment. Uh, that's going to do it for you in an easy-to-use self-service uh, interface uh, directly from your M365 admin console. Same thing with Migration Manager. This is going to be for file shares. Uh, so you have a sh file share environment. You've never been in the cloud. You know, this is your first dip into the cloud. You need to get your data into the cloud. That's where Migration Manager is going to come in, and that's going to safely interact with your data on those uh, file share systems uh, using, again, a friendly interface that's easy to use and simply just map your data into your M365 account. Um, and then fresh to the offering within the last year is the Mover tool. Um, this this was acquired last year, about 18 months ago, and they do cloud to cloud. So Mover was around for a good six and a half years before the acquisition. Did some heavy hitting customers that impressed Microsoft. Um, and again, I'm a little biased there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was designed from the ground up for cloud to cloud migrations. It's a funny story. It was um, the old CEO who is now uh, within the migration, leading the migration space in, in ODSP, uh, uh, Microsoft ODSP. He designed it just because he needed to get his data from one cloud to another. He's, maybe there's a company here and he did it. So it's a, it's a great success story and it's a great tool. Uh, so this is designed for cloud to cloud. This is going to get your data you at administrator level and all of your users within whatever cloud storage provider, major cloud storage providers, and some lesser known um, as well. And it's going to get all that data and, and uh, some metadata and your permissions over into M365. Uh, so you're using M365, um, you know, after a quick migration, a quick cutover period on a weekend, um, you're using M365 on a Monday. You're just uh, hitting the ground running after that lift and shift or sorry, copy and paste of data from say box google dropbox or ignite into a uh, one drive and sharepoint online no absolutely thanks okay that was a great overview bring it all back to me with fast track can you talk a bit about maybe introduce a little bit what fast track is for the audience for folks that don't know and then kind of how does fast track play into leveraging these capabilities mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so fast track is microsoft's migration team you know it's 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 been designed uh, from the ground up to provide a migration experience for the customers and beyond that you know it's, it's it can go into um, helping you get your mail over if you have some exchange stuff it can help you with your your data migration if you're going from any of those tools um, uh, mover especially and we have uh, migration manager especially from source to destination they have the team that'll do that for you but further than that you know their, their team will do the button pressing for you it'll use these tools Tools that you can also use to self-service, but they'll have, they have a team that'll do this for you. But further than that, they have a um, a, a pretty great card-based onboarding system that'll walk you through the onboarding um, at your own time, at your own pace. Um, so it's 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 a very self-serve this portion if you want it to be, but with the engagements uh, from the fast track team, if you if you want uh, a little assistance through that onboarding, set it up your users and your your licensing and things like that. And then if you want someone doing the button pressing on the migrations, uh, they do obviously have qualification you know qualifications you have to meet. I, I believe it's a seat number of uh, 500 users or more. Uh, but if you don't meet that, they will still give you assistance through through um, troubleshooting through their onboarding system and their their customer migration experience system through a self serve uh, perspective. They'll still give you that help. Um, but 500 seats and more, you can get someone to introduce you to their offering, introduce you to the tools that they use to do it. And then once you are ready to go, you've done your assessment through them. You've done your um, migration setup after they've trained you on that. They'll do the, uh, you'll submit your desired migration to them and they'll, they'll execute that for you. Yeah, from start to finish. They'll help you through that troubleshooting. They'll get you going using M365 uh, as soon as that migration is done. You know, it's a, a great balance of someone doing some labor for you, but also uh, you doing it within your own timeline and, and submitting only what you need to do once you've defined that and getting that done. Someone within Microsoft getting that done for, uh, for free. And it's, of course, it goes broader than uh, what we often think about for OneDrive and SharePoint to cover a whole array of different services, correct? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm admittedly more in the migration space. Right. I interact with the migration uh, people at Fast Track more, more than uh, anyone else. But certainly, yes, it's like I said, there, there's uh, onboarding experience that you can go through there as well as that, you, you know, uh, security setup. 
your user setup. The whole the whole tool is there with certain wizards. Um, they have uh, uh, many different wizards that will take you through a guided process on how to get your tenant set up, uh, how to get that security in place. And sometimes it's even, you know, for specific tenants as well. If you're EDU, they're going to help you uh, in a specific way. If you're enterprise, they're going to help you in a specific way with these wizards as well. So yeah, there's uh, it's more than just migration. Migration is certainly just a part of it. Um, as you're going through the process, the migration, you know, will, will come up. Um, if you're if you haven't interacted with them specifically on migration, uh, it'll certainly come up as part of the onboarding process. Uh, so it's very natural and organic. But of course, you can engage them directly for migration as well. If, when you, like I said, once you know what you're looking for. That was a great snapshot, a great overview. And those are some great tools, amazing tools that and options that are being offered by Microsoft. But I would also like to add that there are some amazing options in our, among our partners as well with third-party tools that can help with data migrations. Irrespective of what customers choose, I'm pretty sure, Joshua, you've guided them through some best practices around creating a strong migration plan. What are your recommendations on the initial planning around the proposed migration? You know, you're, you're correct that we have some great tools in-house that, uh, that we can offer them. But there's great partners and tools uh, that we work with uh, externally that, that can help with migration. And, and that's perfectly, you know, that's something we're, we're happy to offer as well. And you're correct that there are best practices, regardless of what tool you use, that you're going to want to consider for the success of your migration. Uh, let's get real. You know, your <laughs> your migration is probably going to be one of the scariest parts about uh, acquiring M365 and coming off whatever storage system you're on is going to be something that's worth worrying about. Um, but the truth is, if you prepare yourself and you set yourself up for success, you know, you take a step back and look at all the steps it doesn't have to be so scary. It doesn't have to take a long time. And it really can be quite straightforward. I say that, you know, with a level of experience doing it for many, many years. But in doing that, I see how similar all migrations really are uh, in concept and, and, and in technology. So there certainly are some common best practices that that can be followed regardless of what tool you need. The very first I recommend is, of course, assessing your situation. Um, so use a scanning tool to figure out what you have, what you're working with in your source cloud storage environment or on-premise environment. And Microsoft certainly has tools that will do this as well. Uh, Mover being one of them. If you're doing a cloud-to-cloud migration, Mover can interact with your uh, source cloud storage provider at the administrator level and count and identify all the files that each of your users own. And this is really important because you want to know, first and foremost, how much each data, how many files, I I need to say that carefully, um, how many files, items each user owns before you move forward, because that will determine your speed. And I I believe we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But then you also want to find situations that can be remediated before migration. And there, there are certain that are handled programmatically by some of our tools. Uh, for example, if you have invalid characters that M365 doesn't support, but uh, one of the their source cloud storage provider does support, Mover, as an example, will, will strip out these characters for you. So you don't have to worry about the file being rejected from an invalid character. But you do want to see that beforehand, so you can anticipate that. But the Biggest one we come up against is the long path limitation in M365. So that's the the URL path limitation, where the URL path to to any given item can only be so long, and it's roughly 400 characters in um, M365. You need to prep for that, or these files will be rejected. And the downside is that you know a lot of source cloud storage providers, other cloud storage providers, don't have the same limitation, right? You can go you can go well and beyond 400 characters in Box, as an example, and that those files are going to fail as you go into M365. So you want to prep for that. Um, certainly, our tools have reporting. If you have failed files, you you don't have to worry about data being lost or or, or being forgotten about. It, it, you know, all your your failed files will certainly be in our reporting. But preparing beforehand will keep the situation clean. It keeps the errors to a minimum, which keeps stress levels low, which keeps your anxiety low, uh, because errors can be scary. Uh, But if you can anticipate these by scanning, then you're setting yourself up for success. So an example is that long path limitation. This is the one mover will identity, identify these for you. If you're coming over box, Google, Dropbox, Ignite, it'll figure out um, how long 
the path to your any given item is and alert you to um, whether or not they're going to exceed Microsoft's long path limitation. And we highly suggest you take the report that's given at the at the end of the scan and and provide these files to the users that own them and say, hey, these files are gonna <laughs> these files are gonna fail if we try to migrate them to 365. You've made this an unusual, you know, you've either titled this an unusual uh, length, and we've certainly seen <laughs> some unusual uh, uh, long file names, um, or for some reason you've nested this way too deep, and so that path length in, the, in that folder structure is way too too long. It's, it's likely easier to have your users deal with that. You know, often, uh, certainly you can have an administrator go in and, you know, certain cloud storage providers, Google's not one of them. It makes it complicated to log in as a user, but Box is an example. You can go in and do it as an administrator. But we found the most success is in giving that to the users. Give them a deadline. Say, here's a list of files that we know based on the scan that Microsoft provided through Mover. We know are going to fail you need to shorten this uh, before we migrate um, and then give give them a strict deadline. If they don't, we you'll have to manually migrate that file <laughs> because it just can't be accepted. So we found that approach really, really works. Worst case scenario is they don't do it in time and you just get that file that show up as a, as a failed file due to a limitation in M365. That can be manually migrated, but you will need to consider that pass length uh, when you do that. So uh, yeah, absolutely. First step I would say is scan. Scan and prepare. Know what you're up against. The next um, is setting yourself up for a fast migration. And scanning is important to this as well. So uh, there's a common misconception that data size or total data is what we're looking for when we're determining determining timelines. It's not true. Right. <laughs> it's, it's how many items. I hear that one from customers a lot. Always, right? <laughs> it's, um, again, let's be real. Timeline is going to be one of the most important things in setting yourself up for success because you need to communicate to your users what's happening. You to continue using the source data to until you do an incremental or delta pass uh, over a weekend and then your cutover period. But the reality is it affects your users, right? You're going to want to communicate heavy communication, communication to your users on what the structure is going to look like at the, the end of the day. You know, are they expecting a migration folder or, or things like that? But you really need to know how much data each of your users own because concurrency is the key to a fast migration uh, and how fast each user can transfer their data using any system, which are basically uh, user-based softwares where you're transferring from a source path to a destination path. Typically, this is user-based. It's going to be the root of a, a, a box, Google Dropbox, Ignite user, uh, to the root of their OneDrive account or, or SharePoint Online document library. Uh, but how fast this one transfer for this user can go is up to how many items they own. Uh, on average, we've seen roughly one file per second per user. And this is going to be based on the source cloud storage provider's API call limits. So yeah, I mean, uh, any cloud search provider is going to tell you how much you can download from the API. And, and let's be honest, it's the same on M365. Our migration API is only going to say you can upload so much data uh, into a, a given document library so quickly. But on most cloud storage providers in the source, this is based on per user. And that's why um, your transfers are going to be per user uh, when you're doing cloud to cloud. Uh, and then roughly, like I said, we can only do one file per second per user. The key then is to stack those transfers, those user transfers, in order to get as much transfer concurrency as you can. Uh, it will be up to our infrastructure if you're using one of our tools, how many of those you can stack and run. But that's a good way to play with the source cloud storage providers per user API call limits is, um, sure, Joshua's transfer who owns 1 million files in any given source cloud storage provider, you know, we can only do one file per second. Uh, on average, you know, this is a rough estimate. Uh, so 1 million seconds for Joshua's transfer to finish may not be acceptable. We can run, you know, um, any other... Yeah, Anka, Anka does transfer, for example, in parallel, everyone else in the tenant in parallel. So they're each doing one file per second. But Joshua's transfer, because he owns a million files, is still going to take one million seconds because that's the there's no there's no increased lanes of traffic we can get out of that data. And this is where understanding how much data he has really is important because then we know Joshua who owns a million files. Well, how do we get that 
the, the traffic lanes out of that? How do we play with that per user API call limit? Split up his data. Um, if you know he owns a million files, it's going to take a million seconds. Well, let's create a service account. Uh, let's change the ownership of half his data. So 500,000 files, give it to the service account. It, that's not going to break uh, collaboration. So you never have to worry about that. It will change ownership. Let's, let's be honest there. It will change ownership. But Josh will still have his co-owner collaborations in some, you know, in, in, depending on the cloud storage provider, or at the very least editor. And that's going to allow you to do two transfers then with 500,000 files. If you could split it up to 250,000, then you could do four transfers because you're playing with that per user throughput limit. Uh, and then by splitting up their data, you're, you're getting more per users out of it, more per user throughput limits. Yeah, this is this classic bandwidth, right? How many how many lanes and, and how fast can each lane go? Exactly. I, I think that's a really great point. And it's, it's interesting to think about as you're planning your migration you, to the point on scanning, being super intentional about, you know, where are you coming from? What is it you have to move? What does it look like? What is that going to be per user across all of those bases? But also just, you know, the planning then turning into this, okay, well, how are we going to pull that together and make it work great? There's huge opportunity across those pieces. And I'm, I love hearing about kind of the thoughtfulness that you all have put in into making sure that that goes as fast and as seamlessly as, as people can do. It, it, and that's that's exactly right. This is one of the biggest. This is really going to be one of the biggest best practices we can offer for a quick migration. And that's going to be one of the biggest concerns because you want to affect the users as little as possible. You want uh, you don't want business interruption and you, you don't have to worry. None of our tool none of our tools will interrupt business because we're not removing data. But and you are likely going to want to predict some sort of time. A lot of people go in thinking, okay, I have 100 terabytes, I have 200 terabytes, I have this many users, how long is that going to take? We will always say, how many files does each of your users own? I've already given you metrics, so you can start to do some math for that planning. That's really how we do the math to plan. Now, again, let's mm-hmm. this is technology. Predicting time periods for a migration is a, a tricky, fickle little thing. Uh, and it's hard to do. So keeping that in mind, at least you have a starting point to start making predictions. Um, but then, like I said, you want to stack those transfers. Um, so you do also have to understand how many transfers you can run at a time. Of course, the software is going to determine that the, you know, the your tenant health is going to determine that um, on both sides. Um, so you certainly want to make sure that uh, your tenant on Microsoft is set up and ready to go. Uh, you you know, if let's, for example, say you have 200 terabytes to migrate, 300 terabytes to migrate. Well, does Microsoft know um, if you told someone at Microsoft, you know, you're, I, certainly you're working with representation. If you have that much data, you're that big of a customer. Have they let the infrastructure people know? Have they let the server people know? Uh, Because that much data, we really do want to set your tenant up for success. I would suggest to anybody listening, if they have that much data, reach out to your accounts team and say, uh, what do we do here? How can we set up our server for success and our our tenant for success? They should know. If they don't, then certainly we can reach out to me and I can point them in the right direction. But we do want to do that as well. And then certainly your source cloud storage provider it will limit how many can run concurrently. We don't. We they'll never allow us to hammer your tenant with API calls. But we've seen upwards of hundreds of transfers running at a time concurrently. So you can imagine one second, one file per second per user. If you're stacking a hundred transfers, that's a uh, hundred files per second, right? So that's really the key is that concurrency. And if you can do them all at once, I know you may have 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 50,000 users or more, but if you can do all of those at once, and I just mean the first pass, you know, the copy and paste of the the data, their folder structure and their permissions, um, while they continue to use the source, we can talk about and plan cutover periods and delta passes, you know, once that first seed of data is done. But if you can do those all at once and get that first pass done all at once, then you have potential for a really quick migration. Because one of the most common things we see when we have people who are concerned with speed is that they're not actually submitting enough data to Microsoft. You know, we'll look at how much data has been uploaded during a migration. And that's it'll be very much that is, well, you could have submitted more jobs through Mover or SPMT or Migration Manager. Um, you didn't. And then that's typically because someone's trying to do something departmentally or in groups. But if you can do a big bang approach, and I know this is one of our big, big best, or sorry, one of our best practices is a big bang approach. If you can do that, then the servers and the runners 
always have something to process. Um, it's not waiting for you to submit the next job. And that's really important as well. So typically, big bang approach, understanding how much data your users own, uh, you really want to arm yourself with, with this before going into migration, I think, really understand how we get throughput, uh, how that really works. And that's going to start with the scan uh, uh, and really just determining how it's all laid out. That's awesome, Joshua. And I think, you know, kind of you've covered really well the whole set of staging and thinking through overall about how you get prepped and and you set yourself up for success and how some of the technology works underneath around that migration. Maybe kind of a last question to dig in here would be kind of what are the top best practices for someone to be thinking about when they're actually running a migration? You mentioned a couple of things earlier, like, um, you know, we want to make sure that tenant health is good. We don't want to we want to ensure there's no business continuity problems. We want to make sure you're able to to keep your business running smoothly and, and in a great place. But what are the major things that kind of pop out for making sure that you're going to have the best possible uh, migration you can? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a great question. And doing a pilot is certainly one of those. So you you will have the opportunity through any of our tools to do a pilot. Um, you can identify what users you want to run in a, a test transfer for or a, a test migration for to see how everything is going to look. You can you can pick and choose that. There's no, within my knowledge and the software we offer, there's no all or nothing scenario. So certainly you have the ability to do a pilot. So typically what we suggest, depending on the size of your migration, so it's going to change for scale, obviously, but we would suggest if you have a couple thousand users to choose 100 users to pilot on, roughly 50 to 100 users. And you want to look at... Are there folder structures retained? Are there permissions retained? You know, have we have we identified their long path, the files that exceed the long path limitation? You know, are we okay with the plan to go forward with that? Are we happy with their solution for the invalid characters? You know, there's there's a whole checklist of things that I can provide. We suggest in the pilot, but typically it's going to be: Am I getting a similar experience to the source? You know, is because you you want to you, you want to limit how much change is happening to your users. You don't want your users to have change fatigue. So we suggest keeping your migration as simple as possible, as as you know, straightforward and and copy and paste as you can. But this is where you get to see that experience in the pilot. Uh, you get to, you know, uh, bring in some people that are willing to be your pilot subjects to tell you, yeah, this looks like it looked like in the source cloud storage provider. Yes, my permissions came. I still have access. This looks great. So that's going to give you your first bout of confidence, I think. You can also start to predict a little bit of, t- of how fast this is going to go in a pilot. Keep in mind the things I've already said in, you know, you want to choose users where the data spread out really well. Uh, you don't want to put add someone in the pilot that owns a million files because <laughs> that's just going to you know take too long for a pilot. You want to choose users that collaborate with each other so you can see those collaborations intact. So yeah, certainly say do a pilot and there's there's full freedom to do that. The next I would say is confirm your identities. So when you're going from one cloud storage provider to another, or sometimes, you know, on premise, you need to consider those identities for access. Uh, and then so you know, you're migrating, you're putting the data in the right place, right? So at any point, you're, you're going to have to define that. Uh, where's my data coming from? And where am I putting it? And, and like I've already said, that's typically going to be user to user. So it's straightforward in a lot of cases. You just want to make sure that those map. And and uh, if they do not map, first and foremost, the software is not going to be able to find the user uh, to put the data in. But most importantly, it's for that permission aspect. Uh, we want to make sure that your collaborations are still being set, right? The, the goal of migration is that you can use it Monday morning the way you're using it the Friday prior. So you need to make sure those collaborations are set properly, um, and the software is going, going to need to know those name changes beforehand. Um, so understand your identities between the source and destination. If you can't provision them the same, uh, just keep note beforehand before your migration of who is mismatched. Now, with that said, if I use uh, Mover as an example, again, it's able to identify these mismatches for you. Uh, it's able to show you who doesn't have a match and who does. So it makes it easy on you. But any other, some other tools may not have that that uh, ability, and you're still going to want to know your identities. Uh, So you may have to do a custom mapping depending on the software. So yeah, I would say go in knowing your identities, make sure everyone's provisioned. Uh, You want to make sure everyone has a license in M365. If they're 
going to receive data in their OneDrive, that OneDrive needs to be activated. And then um, in some cases, you might need to pair those users that have different usernames. But in most cases, you'll have exact matches and the software is going to detect that. Thanks, Joshua. You've been you've been such a font of knowledge and all the background and details and kind of the you know the nitty gritty of of how this works and how people can take advantage of it and leverage it. I really appreciate that and kind of going into a bunch of those details. Ankita, do you have any other questions? That was a great response, Joshua. And seriously, as uh, Jason mentioned, the nitty gritties were. Amazing. I mean, I got to learn a lot today. Um, having said that, the final question is, could you walk us through some real life examples? I'm pretty sure you've worked with a lot of customers, but a couple of customers that stand out uh, that you could share your experience about so that our listeners can benefit as well. Yeah, Expedia was a great example of the long path limitation um, and how they remediated that and followed best practices there. So if I remember correctly, they had, of course, every tenant is going to have, um, from where they were coming from, uh, long path limitations, and the last the source has the same limitation. You think you may not have it, but there's a good chance you have at least one user um, that has uh, files that exceed Microsoft's long path limitation. Uh, Expedia certainly did, and they had a lot. Uh, they followed best practices where they were able to do an assessment scan. We were able to determine uh, how many files exceed this long path limitation, what they are, and then who owned them. Further than that, uh, reporting exists within Microsoft tools to suggest where those long paths should be remediated to sh to shorten the path in the most effective way possible. So we have reporting that's able to say, um, just fix this parent folder and it's going to fix all these problems, right? So you can fix a thousand different files that exceed Microsoft's long path limitation just by finding that one parent folder. And we have reporting that'll do that for you. So we were able to share this with, with Expedia and they followed those best practices of, hey, Team, you have to do this. You know, communication to your users, you have to do this uh, or you're going to lose these files. You're going to lose these files if you don't do this. Here's a list. You have till this deadline to do it or you're going to have to manually migrate this data. Just setting those users up for that expectation and every single user was able to do it by the deadline and we had no long path limitations. So uh, uh, files that failed due to the long path limitations. So it was a great example of why setting a deadline works. And we know that in general in the world, setting a deadline is a good thing. But in a migration, certainly, especially if you have user led interaction, you need users to remediate certain files, give a deadline and, and, and just let them know you won't have this file, you'll have to manually migrate it. Yeah, Expedia had many different sources. We had to do this for different uh, tenants. Uh, and it was certainly a benefit to have that structure and how you communicate to your users. Thank you so much, Joshua. It's been great to have you on. Um, of course, we always like to ask our guests one last kind of fun question, learn a little bit more about them, how they see the world. So our question this month is, if you could eliminate one thing from your daily routine, what would it be? And this is kind of a challenging one, like, because, you know, I've, I've heard lots of answers to this over time. It's always uh, the funny common answer tends to be I'd get rid of having to brush my teeth, not because people don't care about good dental hygiene, but because it takes time. And so it's an understandable one. For me, if I could eliminate one thing from my daily routine, it would be getting up early to help our puppy go outside and go to the bathroom. I want uh, the puppy to uh, somehow magically figure out how to maybe use the bathroom. Uh, just it would be great if, you know, those days where I like to sleep in that I didn't feel the pressure to get up and um, and let uh, let the dog out. So that would be my my item. Uh, Joshua, how about you? Mine uh, shows how uh, eccentric I am, I think, a little bit of my eccentricities, but uh, <laughs> I'd cut out my, <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed, I'd cut out my first thing in the morning bubble bath. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about this before. I take a bubble bath as soon as I wake up every single morning. And now I highly recommend this. It's a great way to start your day. It, it not only feels great, but it, it forces your brain into a, a space of awakeness. But sometimes I'm a late for I'm late for work. So, <laughs> so that one, just to have a better work ethic, I think I would uh, cut out my morning bubble bath. I apologize that that one's a little weird. 
<laughs> no, that's not weird at all. I lo- First of all, Joshua, thank you for sharing that because <laughs> I haven't heard of that one before and I love hearing new things. Yeah. And I love that you do that. Like, that's so cool. Oh, it's, it's, oh, it feels so good. It's just, it, it, like I said, it forces it, it, it causes a buzz through my, my skin that I can't explain. And you're just awake. Yeah. You're awake and energized. Yeah. 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 No, it's a great way to, you're getting your week started or getting your day started. I, I think that's an awesome one. Okay. Akita. I, I'm not sure how you're going to top that, but what's what's yours? Mine is a no-brainer. I would get rid of cooking right away. I want my food to magically appear on the table. That's actually a good one. Ooh, a good yeah, one. I have never cooked. I've not cooked a day in my life till I moved to the US. And since coming here, it's become such a big part of my life. And, it's, and Indian cooking is not that easy. So it really irritates me every day. But uh, what are you going to do? That's a good one. Yeah, I, I, I can understand that. Yeah, that certainly takes up a bunch of time and being able to eliminate that from the routine would, would be helpful. Well, thank you both for that. I was just saying, I read the other day, I think on Twitter, someone had mentioned, I don't understand the concept of cooking for 30 to 45 minutes and eating for just 10 minutes. And you're just eating it, yeah. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it resonated so much with me. I did not cook for the next few days. I was like, yes, why am I putting in 45 minutes of effort for just 10 <laughs> minutes? Yeah, I'm that, I'm that. Oh, it's all going to the same place, guy. So yeah. it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. It's funny because I, I also know people in my life who absolutely love it. And the process itself is a joy yeah. uh, for them. So I think there's there's definitely interesting, like unique personal yeah. perspectives in each of those. Well, thank you both so much for those answers. Those were uh, fantastic and interesting. And I hope the audience enjoyed listening to those. You know, Joshua, just kind of finally for audience, how can people find and learn more about you? Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, where, where can they look you up? Yeah, I mean, I, it's just my name everywhere. So I'm lucky enough to have a uh, rare enough name that I get it on all that there's social media or so just look me up on LinkedIn. Um, I'm sure my name spelling and everything will be in uh, the show notes. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. If you're within Microsoft, easy to find on Teams as well. So if we have migration scenarios, you don't know what to do with them. Uh, just let me know. There's no bothering me. I I likely will be able to find the right direction to send your migration, whether that be self-serve or one of the migration tools in Microsoft. And uh, if you need some training too, or advice on how to, you know, if if you're internal to Microsoft and how to work with your customers through migration, that's what I'm here for. So happy to help any way I can. I love that. Uh, Very soon, we are also going to do a webinar with Joshua and one of his team members. Both of them will talk about all the tools that we discussed today, the best practices. You can learn more about it in the blog that we are going to publish along with this podcast. So the link to that blog would also be in the show notes. And uh, make sure you register for the podcast to learn more about uh, migration. And next up, we have our roadmap announcements. Yes. So last month, we started rolling out dark mode for OneDrive Web. So all you dark mode fans, you can now have that in your OneDrive Web experience as well. In your sharing mails, uh, you would also now have at a glance summaries. So new information like estimated time to read as well as key points in the document, similar to the file hover card uh, that would help you get more information on how relevant the shared document is. Um, You can also now use a new bookmark option that we are rolling out in OneDrive for iOS to add bookmark to your important PDF pages so you can pick up from where you've left off. And finally, we are updating the OneDrive Sync client to support version history for DWG files. One of the big feedback that we got from you guys. So um, I look forward to you being happy about it. To learn more about these features, uh, check our tech community blog post for our roadmap blogs. Um, And now over to you, Jason, for our special topic. This week's show is brought to you by Microsoft Lists, your smart information tracking app in Microsoft 365. Keeping track of information isn't everyone's job description today. Writing things down works for simple lists, but it can get overwhelming when you need to stay on top of hundreds of items and get others to pay attention and act. Microsoft Lists is a Microsoft 365 app that helps you easily track information and organize your work. Lists are simple, smart, and flexible, so you can stay on top of what matters most to your team. Track issues, assets, routines, contacts, inventory, and more. Using customizable views and smart rules and alerts to keep everyone in sync. 
With ready-made templates, you can quickly start lists online, on our new mobile app for iOS, and directly within Microsoft Teams. And because it's part of Microsoft 365, you can rely on enterprise-ready security and compliance. Your lists just got a whole lot smarter. Get more done with Microsoft Lists. Go to aka.ms forward slash ms lists for more information, videos, demos, blogs, and more. That's aka.ms forward slash ms lists. Make a list and let it flow. Well, Ankita, I wanted to share a bit about the journey we've been on in the OneDrive and SharePoint team about how we're continuing to learn and adapt in this world of working from home. Yeah, it's surely been a minute. And that was a lot of change for all of us to absorb. How has the team been doing? You know, as you'd expect, we've gone through a pretty full range of experiences. We've been learning about how we can all work remotely, what it means to have every conversation through a screen, but also challenges that, you know, each of us might be dealing with individually during the pandemic. There's a lot of range across that. Uh, last fall, about six months in, we decided to actually take a step back and reassess where we were at and how we were running the team. And what made you do that? Well, we, we run a weekly pulse across our broader team. And once a month as part of that, we actually check in on how happy people are at work. A really simple question. And we'd noticed that we were on a worrying trend where that was on a decline. And so we took some time to step back and reevaluate. And so, we you know, last year we saw some truly amazing growth and just phenomenal customer success. But we knew that it was starting to really take a toll on all of us as a team. So, I mean, after stepping back and realizing this, where did you start? Well, uh, that's actually what I wanted to talk about today. You know, it's easy when we're talking about challenges or problems to kind of jump right in. And in fact, one of the things we did really intentionally was to kind of approach it using something called the ACES framework. I know this one. Acknowledge, clarify, explore and solve, right? Right. Bingo. For, you know, for those of you who don't know, this is not magic. It's just a helpful rubric to figure out problems. One of the things that all of us do is we tend to jump to solutions. We tend to have answers and we want to immediately take away the pain or challenge of something. But that can often miss the point or even make us miss out on the right solution for something. And so the ACES framework is really about helping you take the time to acknowledge through listening, to seek clarity before kind of leaning into exploring what the actual kind of opportunities are and then coming up with the solution. So acknowledging without judging is where we start. And how do we do that? Well, a great way to kick this off is to use phrases like, I've noticed that and I can see that. And, you know, where you're really trying to state what you're perceiving as simply as possible without judging. You know, I mean, it really is important to be able to, you know, either diffuse or help keep uh, tense or complex situations as calm as possible by giving acknowledgement to others and kind of space for their perspectives, not judgments. And this is one of the key places to really start is kind of go, hey, do we all have some sharing to do to acknowledge both the realities everyone's experiencing, but also kind of the, the results of that? So I can understand how that is helpful in moving the conversation forward. Did I do that right? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. Uh, you know, you've stated there, I can understand, you know, it's kind of that simple phrase there. And you kind of helped it by talking about how it's helpful in moving the conversations forward. So you kind of acknowledge and, and demonstrated that. And once you've spent enough time here, you know, that you kind of know that you're in the right place because people feel uh, that they've gotten through that you get to really step into clarity. That's step two of all of this. And what you're trying to do here is really learn and kind of make good questions, ask good questions out of it. Um, really simple ways to start is to say things like, am I missing something? You know, what is your perspective? What is your experience? These are open-ended questions and they really allow you to get more clarity by hearing more information and more viewpoints. You're really taking a time to make sure you've got all of those things collected. And you kind of get to the opportunity to kind of to dive in deeper because you spent that energy up front acknowledging uh, that there could be these perspectives, that there can be different uh, viewpoints on it. And so with Clarity, you're really trying to get to a place where people have shared those pieces and you've got, you know, a modicum of understanding across different kind of states. 
So we have acknowledged, we have clarified, and now we would explore. I imagine here I should be asking about consequences. If we do this, then what happens? Absolutely. And in fact, you know, you're really looking to keep a broad space, right? We're not in the solution space yet, but you're kind of avoiding leading questions. That's going to end the search early. You're really trying to create room for as many good ideas as possible by establishing a broad understanding, taking what you were acknowledging before, taking the clarity you created by asking those open-ended questions. You're now trying to drive a little bit to consensus of the broad understanding, all of those different angles and viewpoints on it. And you'll know you're doing it right when some of the things you explore are even contradictory, you know, because different choices are going to eliminate different potential branching outcomes from it. And being able to hold that in mind and know that those choices can exist really helps everyone, again, feel heard and, and included as part of that, but also to make sure you're thinking as broadly as you can about the opportunity. And the broader the perspective, the better the ideas you get, right? Absolutely. And and from there, you get to solve, right? We get to that, the S of ACEs. You're looking to get alignment on picking a path. Now that you've talked about it broadly, you've got the, all those different perspectives. You're kind of saying, gosh, you know, what are we willing to consider? Would you be willing to consider doing X? What would a better solution look like to you? That helps you bring everybody along. And especially in a complex or a difficult space where it's not quite simple and obvious. And because you're being inclusive, you're seeking the breadth of that understanding clarity, and you're willing to explore those different outcomes, you actually then get to pick from a better set of solutions in a much more simplified and aligned way because everyone's been kind of come along in that journey. I really like that. And I look forward to us practicing it more as well. I'm, I'll be more than happy to share this with my team too. Um, thanks for walking us through that, Jason. Looking forward to the next one. Thank you again to our guest, Joshua Badish. To learn more about OneDrive and the latest developments, please follow our tech community blog at ek.ms slash OneDrive slash blog. And please do send us your questions and feedback. You can reach us on Twitter at, at OneDrive, at Jasmo, and at Ankita underscore Kirti21. And definitely visit our show page for links, resources, and more at aka.ms slash Synca. That's S-Y-N-C-U-P. Subscribe to and follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. Word of mouth is still the very best way people learn about new podcasts and new information. Tell your colleagues, your friends, your city council person, even your waste management driver. And if you're curious about other cool shows by Microsoft, go to aka.ms slash Microsoft slash podcasts. There's something for everyone. Thank you for listening to Sync Up, a show about OneDrive. We are your hosts, Ankita Kirti and Jason Moore. We'll catch up with you next month.